Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Stemshes, Director of the Antenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, and welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of Hur and Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, today's lecture is Elizabeth and Tony Comper lecture in Holocaust Studies, and I'm really excited to welcome Professor Gottschall uh, to deliver it for us. I also want to say that uh, I'm glad to see that the Joseph Shire is in the room today. We just enjoyed two uh, lectures by Shire Visiting Shire Professor Levi Romanik on Monday and on Wednesday, and uh, um, uh, as I mentioned in my first, uh, in my remarks, uh, unfortunately, Milton Shire, uh, Joseph's uh, dad, passed away just a week ago, right? So uh, Joseph said he couldn't come, but we're very happy that you're here with us, and it means a lot. Thank you. Um, so today's lecture, as I said, will be delivered by uh, one of our colleagues, always a treat for us, uh, <laughs> Professor Willie Gottschall. I have no, uh, Professor Willie Gotcha was the first person I met when I came to University of Toronto uh, 21 years ago. I saw him in the hallway of the German department and he said to me, good Shabbos. And I thought, oh my God, the German department is so welcoming. They wish me good Shabbos before I even got here, which good Shabbos means, you know, uh, Shabbat Shalom in Yiddish. So anyway, later I learned that Professor Gotcha actually is working on Jewish uh, studies and the specialist on uh, German uh, Jewish studies, uh, philosophy, and uh, his cross appointment with between uh, the German department and the department of philosophy and proudly, I hope, affiliated with the Antenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. When uh, Professor Gilchelan once to, went to the Association of Jewish Studies meeting together many years ago, uh, it was like going to Jewish studies with a rock star accompanying you, like all these people. You know, normally I just say hi to people I knew from grad school, but this time they read his name tag and they kept asking me to introduce him to Dave Willie Gottschall. So <laughs> I was honored to do that. And now I'm honored to introduce uh, him speaking for us. I think it's the first time in Jewish studies, right? The, that you're giving a lecture, maybe, well, first in recent memory since COVID. Uh, so his publications uh, are plenty and they included the, include the field of uh, critical theory, Jewish thought, and German-Jewish culture, literature, and philosophy. His most recent book is called, uh, uh, um, is it the most recent Heine and Critical Theory? Came out in 2019. Uh, and his current project is entitled Difference and Alterity in Modern Jewish Philosophy. Probably it's coming out tomorrow, right, Professor Gosha? <laughs> Yesterday. Um, in 2020, Professor Goetzel was awarded Moses Mendelssohn Prize in the city of Dessau. And today he will deliver for us a talk entitled From the Jewish Renaissance to Life After Auschwitz, Margaret Sussman, a philosopher in her time. And I think it's her birthday, was it the last week? Next week, you'll talk about that. So it's a special uh, moment for that. So. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes uh, before you clap for Professor Gertschel. Um, the event is live streamed, so if you're listening uh, on the line, please, um, uh, uh, please write your questions in the chat and we will read them for you. If you're a grad student, you get to ask your questions first to get the priority, but wait please for the microphone when it will come to you so that our online audience can listen to uh, your, hear your questions as well. I think I more or less covered all the notes. So now please officially welcome Professor Goldberg. Oh, you Okay, thank you very much for this very kind and welcoming um, introduction at home. Um, I came all the way back from Zurich 
um, to talk today, otherwise I would have come today. Um, and I was randomly selected for a PCR test. So anything that's bad in my uh, talk, I blame on the Canadian government's um, saving money for having um, tests on arrival and like let them people to do it by themselves. I spent a nice time figuring that out and I'm figuring it out as we go. I have been tested already. We don't know the <laughs> result for many days. <laughs> Um, anyways, so um, it's very nice uh, to give this talk here because as uh, Professor Strunch has uh, mentioned, it's actually the 150th birthday this year of Margaret de Sussman, uh, who was born 14th of October, 1872. Um, and the, the long worded title um, in German is much shorter if I would give it in German and it would just be Margaret Sussmann, eine deutsche Philosophin. Um, and in German it has all the aggressive connotations in it, but in English uh, it's from the Jewish Renaissance, as you may know when it happened to life after Auschwitz. Uh, Margaret Sussmann, a philosopher in her time. And the, the what I'm trying to do is um, not over burden this with information, um, but sort of more look at the discourse um, because some, uh, most of her books and are not, trans actually none of her book is translated into English. There's a new volume with a slim selection of slim shorted essays that give uh, very little um, a section of her work. So what I, my work today is just to talk about why you all don't know her, which is fine. Um, and it's not your fault for a change. That makes you all feel very good. Um, but it's the fault of others. Um, and uh, then I give you sort of a snapshot. OK, so the first thing, the first challenge is for me, actually, uh, the question how to talk about a woman philosopher who is also one of the first women philosophers at all. And I don't want to uh, have a long argument why I call it the first woman philosopher. The short version is that uh, the women who are philosophizing before her, starting from the, you could even say Socrates' uh, wife, Santi, if you want, actually, I could do this argument if, I, if you want to, if you get there, to Hypatia, all the way through the 17th, 18th century, we're mostly, I mean, accepting actually Xantip and um, Socrates' wife, uh, women um, of uh, the leisure class who were sort of like doing that as a hobby and treat it as if they would do it as a hobby. And um, so they did not, they were not able to actually make really critical contribution that doesn't speak about any ability or disability. That's just how it came out. Uh, where Sussman at the end of the 19th century was put in a position to, as I would like to argue, actually make a critical difference in philosophy. Uh, although it's still um, not really recognized, but I came just back from a conference uh, on Sussman, the first actually conference dedicated to Sussman in uh, at that large size. And um, it was actually wonderful just to see how clear the research is going to be when the book that will clearly come out of it is around maybe 18 papers or so is going to um, be ready. So a woman philosopher, a notion that had for centuries, if not millennia, been practically impossible to imagine, not to say, quote unquote, think, at least for those who considered philosophy to be a male privilege, which is most of our colleagues, of course. A woman, Mar she was a woman marginalized and more often simply excluded from philosophy and more importantly also in our concern from its historical record or what we call uh, historiography. So the challenge of how to undo this respectively reimagine that history that is yet to be reconstructed and rewritten, and that means reimagine is not so easy because, um, as you may know, just starting talking about it may reproduce a lot of stuff. So 
the question was what title would I give this talk today and um, so when I discussed that uh, with my wife what to do she simply said uh, and I didn't put that as a title because I was too anxious but she said Ma Margaret is Usman man's played by Willy Gertschel um, and that is exactly the challenge okay and we'll get a little bit more to it why because that is automatically the the real question but um what i want to do now i just give you an example how insidious that was and still is and not when she was um a very young philosopher budding philosopher at which point she was actually quite renowned as we will see when we go on but actually when she died in January 1966 uh, in Switzerland, in, um, and 12 days later, uh, one of her last texts of the, at that point, sort of like around 93 year old, appears as a tribute to her. And it's an interesting little text, actually. I mean, I don't know how many 93 year old are still able to write. Um, that clear, it is quite an achievement and sovereign. And uh, it's actually, and so what it was was a book review on a volume of essays on Ernst Bloch, her friend from uh, youth. And that there was, and so I'm not really talking about that. I'm just interested in the editorial tribute, which read, so it's translated, so it, uh, you don't get the full seasoning of it, um, but it said, Susman died on January 16, 1966. Um, of course, I thought, well, wouldn't you write passed away or something, but um, already that was the first. But anyway, a doctor had said, like honoris causa, Margarete von Bendemann Susman died in Zurich, where she lived since her migration, uh, emigration from Germany. Her life was of interest now. That's the operating sentence here. I, I hope you have fun. Her life was of interest foremost because of the fact that she knew the most important people of her time and that, she, um, that her innermost destiny revealed itself by way of her personal encounter with them. Okay. Um, I come back to another little. Um, uh, sign, um, um, non-alphabetical, non-diacritical sign in a moment. Um, so actually, she is presented as a salonier that she actually never was, and how she begins in her book, Women of Romanticism. Um, you could say um, Woody Allen's character, Selig, sends his regard. And indeed, um, I hope so. some of you have seen the movie. I never thought of it as relevant, but uh, now it's relevant. Um, Woody Allen's, he sends his regards. Indeed, Sussman's predicament of curious invisibility could not be characterized more succinctly the way Allen's comedic character does. Um, Zelig is, um, since I didn't get any left, is um, this character who um, has known everybody, seen everybody, and he's retroactively um, projecting into pictures. He sees the programs, of course. And so that feels a little bit um, uh, how Margaret Sussman is treated. So um, the first thing is, well, she, her legal name was indeed at some point Margarete von Bendemann Sussman. She uh, also divorced in 1929. And so that was like uh, 37 years earlier and published always under her name, uh, Margaret Sussman. And that's usually how we treat authors with their pen name. Um, but uh, more fun, if you wanna um, have a more deconstructionist approach here is that Sussman is consistently uh, spelled with two N's, not one N. Um, so she's turning her, of course, into a man. And then um, the Swiss and uh, in some places continental uh, um, used to put, um, uh, like when somebody dies and is there, is put a, a crucifix at the end of their name, is also um, offered in this place. Um, so turning her basically in a Christian. And I think if you wanted to put a strong reading on this, you could say 
she is actually presented through the default lens of a man and as a Christian and what else could a philosopher be? Okay, so that's, and what is so um, like odd about it is this at the peak of her um, life after she has all this book, she's just 12 days under the earth and um, it feels as if she wasn't really around. So uh, you probably want to know, like, who was Margaret Sussman? And I try to do this just like very, like in big strokes uh, to not spend too much time on that. And I see I actually should um, take my watch here. So um, we keep track of time. Um, okay, so. Uh, Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, dates and places, just to give you um, some coordinates. She was born 1872 in Hamburg. And now that comes something really interesting. I think her work uh, will be important is she, in 1882, she moves, her family moves to Zurich, Switzerland. And she actually goes to school. She was in private school in Hamburg. In Zurich, she goes to the public school for 10 years and gets through the gymnasium with a mature and a graduates 1894. So really like her, her formative years are in Switzerland and that has uh, will be a consequence at some point. So, um, and then she wants to uh, really study um, and she's of course, I should say at that point by her middle class um, after the father, denied that she says no under um, not until i'm dead actually literally and um but she's allowed as a woman it's okay to do poetry she finances a, a private print um uh, of her uh, of poetry that comes out um, when she's well, exactly to her twenties birthday and then when he dies she's first allowed to um paint she uh, gets trained as a painter and um, so what's important is poetry and painting is not really uh, what she's going to see as her calling, but it's important as her way out. Um, and also, I should say here, too, what is also um, thanks to her sister, her mother is ailing, and her older sister actually releases her from the duty to, uh, sibling duty to take care of her mother. And that one should acknowledge, too, it's actually the older sister who, would sort of give him the title to marry off quickly, who doesn't just for her sister. Um, she she starts um, look, um, studying painting in Düsseldorf, which may not sound so fancy for you, but if I tell you she was also going to Paris to study with Spadak, you will probably think that's uh, a little bit more you know, interesting. She moves then to Munich. Um, and in Munich, she starts actually listening to um, lectures of philosophy, but she makes the point that she has read philosophy all alone. And then in 1900, she goes to Berlin, and there she meets Georg Simmel. I will get to talk to Simmel a little bit more because he's crucial. 1912, she goes back to Zurich. Um, 1915, a year into the war, she goes back to Frankfurt to take care of her husband who was uh, in the war. Um, then they moved to, uh, in the 1920s, to Sekingen on the Rhine, where the best part is when she can look across the Rhine and see Switzerland, because she, um, they gone on a settlement, according to Lachlus of Landauer's ideas, uh, as a, on a farm and the least thing and the last thing that Sussman ever wanted to be a farmer. That's just not what she could do. So she could actually just like not work and uh, probably, um, and it was just overwhelmed. Then 1929, the divorce when the son is 22 um, and she moves to back to Frankfurt where she lives till 1933. Um, and on the last day of the year 1933, she takes the night train to Zurich and she calls that experience um, um, immigration in, uh, to my homeland um, since she grew up there. So that's just like to give you the dates a little bit and I, I will fill that in as we uh, move on in the lecture. 
the intellectual trajectory mean is Munich, Berlin is Simmel. In Frankfurt, um, she starts she starts already in, in Berlin actually to write for the Frankfurt Zeitung from 1907 to 1932, um, and is the uh, main uh, re critic initially for poetry and then more and more on philosophy. She basically reviews any book publication in the time, including a famous book review of Franz Rosenzweig, um, but possibly everybody else. And um, she has a junior colleague there with one, one she has a major fallout at some point, and that's Siegfried Krakauer, who is counted on she's for a while. Um, and um, so that's just like to, uh, and so that's one thing. The other thing is if you look in terms of what she's actually done, she is, as I mentioned, a poet. She remains a poem and she writes poetry all along um, as many other people do, but it's clearly not uh, her forte, you could say, and she never considered it that. She actually was so successful in with her first poetry collection in 1902, 1901, that um, oops, sorry. That um, she actually with um, and she so she, uh, her poetry collection went through two editions, and then she withdrew the third one when it was going to print because she wanted to break with uh, Stefan Georg and uh, the symbolist um, circle there. Um, and then um, so she is uh, then writing essays. Um, the other thing that's important, she's a public speaker and interlocutor, and at the end of her life, and but already starting with Krakow, actually, she is a mentor. Um, and in big strokes, she really did indeed know a lot of people, except she didn't have a salon. Um, and she interacted then uh, meaningfully, and that from the Oxymo to, and I'll come back to that at the end, Paul Ceylon. Um, so, um, that's just that. So now to be written out of philosophy, um, one didn't have to be a woman, as you may know. You also would qualify for the distinction by exclusion just by being a Jew. Um, and so the, the well-known example, the classic help us for that would be Spinoza and Mendelssohn. And so it is no coincidence that uh, Sussman will emphasize that her, and that's her expression, the first purely philosophical work, as she formulated, was an essay on Spinoza published 1913 in the Prague Student Association for Hofbach's Anthology uh, on Judaism, which was Uber was in it, Bergman, like everybody, Landauer. Um, and of course, she was also the only woman in it. I mean, and, and think that he, of course, is uh, sort of the operating. Uh, qualify here as well. Um, another signature essay, I will come back to the Spinoza essay in a little bit. Um, another signature essay she revised over the years was her essay on Moses Mendelssohn, first published in 1932 and then revised in 1946, Notice, note the years, bracketing the years of uh, 1933 and 1945, Whose point and significance I don't need to explain uh, anybody of you present in this room, um, is really um, uh, makes that essay also a particular message, especially if you then uh, go forward and read it. So with Spinoza and Mendelssohn, we have the two paradigmatic figures in modern Jewish philosophy, both marginalized, excluded, and or assimilated to the mainstream narratives of the history of philosophy. And sometimes one has to regretfully say uh, of Judaism as well. Spinoza on the one hand, and so these are the, the, the typifications that are relevant here um, for the argument. Spinoza usually the irreverent universalist as which he is felt, and Mendelssohn as the stubborn, naive partic particulars. And now it comes the interesting part, and I actually sent that to Margaret de Sussman to think through how they work together. Um, so, so both narratives that are used the one Spinoza and, and so exclude as also 
as also a way to, as, as sorry as a way too complex and abstract thinker and as a, and on the other hand um, as a too simple and derivative case in the case of noble So you have these two extreme uh, and you see already where I'm going you know with the Bolshevist and capitalist too so you get and but now comes what what happens when you do that so they are archetypes and, and and i could prove that you know if you want to i mean i've written a book about exactly how that works actually but i would stand all of a sudden to see how it works uh, in swiss in an interesting way um uh, they they are archetypes of either complete assimilation submitting to a, a dissimulation out of them but the assimilation of the discourse submitting to a universal which ultimately doesn't exist anyway or on the other hand of an identification with, partic with a particular stance Mendelssohn that equally mischaracterizes Mendelssohn's entire project now these two narratives are tied to each other like two sides of the same coin they highlight the sheer impossibility to imagine something like a Jewish philosopher as a fully qualified being this stance is accompanied by an almost paranoid anxiety, I mean, the almost is sort of more comedic, of the philosophical prowess and power ascribed to the two philosophers. Spinoza, of course, is um, feared and, and characterized as the guy who co-wrote, who, sorry, co-writes a theological political treatise uh, together with the devil in hell. Um, imagine just these writing scenes. I mean, it must be fantastic. The ink would like dry right away, no problem with blotting. Mendelssohn, in men the case of Mendelssohn, Lavater's ang deep anxiety that actually, when he asks Mendelssohn to either uh, convert to Christianity or prove actually um, that Christianity is wrong, um, sends out chills across 18th century. Germany, where people actually are fearing that now Mendelssohn is going to come out and you know just prove it's all wrong, uh, which he just wouldn't do even if I could because it would be too dangerous. But of course, he would be philosophically alert enough to know there's no such thing. And then also that probably is Jacobi we have still today, like who exactly won the Spinoza strike or Spinoza dispute. Uh, the verdict I thought is no longer out, but if I read many of my colleagues present colleagues actually totally not included of course not our fantastic Spinoza expert here but there are people who think that actually Jacobi was the winner so um in both of these cases succeeding and that's why now we're back to Sussman succeeding generations of Jewish philosophers from the fallout these events had for Spinoza and, per and uh, Mendelssohn personally we can uh, look away but you can assume that they also got their share of traumata traumatization um that the fact that too the effect that each Jewish philosopher from then on is faced with the challenge to deal with this situation i mean they're usually like called uh, a spinoza Mendelssohn was called a spinoza or um then people are as um alleged to be a Mendelssohn like sort of a synthesis um popularist as he is called or is still called so Sussman really challenges a double uh, a double task here um how to inscribe or, or no sorry so Sussman's uh, is really challenged by a double task here how to inscribe herself as a Jewish philosopher in a course on the uh, on the one hand and on the other hand also of course as a woman and we'll come back to that as well um, because she is not willing to ever sacrifice one or the other, and she's also not willing to um, collapse them into one unit or something, which I think is a really interesting move. She never talks about both of these issues at the same time, um, and I think that's the reason why I think there's an interesting sense of uh, intersectionality that cannot be collapsed, that is not additive in an interesting way, but um, that works in a more sophisticated way on like different layers. So I think from for that we can also learn from her. So to address this double task imposed on her, Sussman approaches these challenges with a writing and thinking style that I think we can characterize in shorthand as écriture Sussman, if you allow me the pun. 
it's an approach. It's not a, 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 a feminine figure, but it's a particular type of writing. It's an approach that continuously reflects its own project as a philosophical mode, intimately linked to its own time and its own particular exigencies, as inseparably tied to doing philosophy as its constitutive factor. And for her, I quote, I give you a quote now from a 1928 essay, the act of understanding, and I read that to you this, uh, because most of the writing is uh, book reviews, essays, interpretations. Um, and what I mean with David Zussman is that she, um, in a very subtle way, uh, makes her arguments, advances her arguments through interpretations, um, which are sort of basically um, like moving uh, the argument along. The act of understanding, I quote her, is itself temporal historical. And this is very important. Um, she is here following Simo, it's an anti Deltai move. The act of understanding is itself temporal historical. And then she says, the unity, and she means of this act of understanding, respectively commenting and interpreting or reviewing. Uh, she writes, this unit, the unity it creates this act of understanding, that is all this temporal and historical, the unity creates is nothing more than the light of an ephemeral moment. And yet, all our truth and the entire relationship of our time of eternity rests on this moment. And indeed, Sussman's essays on Spinoza and Mendelssohn illuminate not only the critical tra tra trajectories of these Jewish philosophers, but do so in a way that brings out the intimate connection of Sussman's new, uh, uh, Sussman's own project, um, that uh, as own as her own, that creatively connect with the respective projects of those two philosophers but advances them in new ways. In other words, Sussman not only grounds her own thought in her predecessors that she claims or reclaims and reimagines Spinoza or Mendelssohn, in, and, and she does so in interpretively remarkable ways, but at the same time, she adds to their trajectory her new way of thinking. And so that is the, if you want, the double move that she does. Um, so I don't want to go more into it. I'm very happy in the Q&A to um, explain more what that means. Um, but now it's time to move on to Simmel. Um, if she situates her own trajectory careful, carefully in a tradition of Jewish thought and a kind of a history of Jewish thought that you don't read in most textbooks, by the way, I should point that out too. Um, she at the same time reimagines in sophisticated form, we also, that in a sophisticated form, sorry, we also need to look at the specific philosophical constellation of her immediate own historical context, her immediate intellectual environment. And um, that was um, the Oxymor. Um, so Simmel uh, was not only a crucial philosopher, um, philosophical interlocutor for um, uh, Sussman. And I apparently don't want to call him her teacher because that would miss the particular character of the relation. Uh, of course, he was among other things also uh, her teacher. Um, but it is here, it is in uh, his social environment, in the seminars, in the friendship that comes out of it. Um, that Sussman uh, becomes a philosopher, um, tech, uh, a philosopher, and also a philosopher in her own right. And she, I will what, explain a little bit um, that was possible also because of the particular philosophical approach that Simon had that is different from others, where it actually makes it possible for women um, to uh, imagine themselves as doing philosophy properly um, in a new way. In Simo, she encounters a new style and form of doing philosophy that will empower her as a philosopher. In addition, the close association and deep friendship between Simo and Sussman, and actually I was sort of like surprising, surprised myself when I wrote down this line, 
that it presents actually a new face in the history of philosophy. It's a friendship where actually they are considering themselves equals in conversation. Um, and uh, that's new in that way. I mean, I let that, I'd be happy actually to be proved wrong and I would take that, but I can't think myself of any other but that it actually happens and we can also talk more about that so so but so simo is uh probably not very well known here except for people who know me and know my enthusiasm for simo um simo not only was actually the most important philosopher of the one of the most important philosophers of the period but also a powerful intellectual soup uh, like a superpower as we call it technically but you don't need to believe me you can believe George Lukács, who says, Simmel was without any doubt the most important and most interesting figure of transition in modern philosophy. Um, but that's not the only thing why Simmel was so important for uh, Sussman and others. But as Lukács uh, also adds, um, and it's interesting to imagine also to track uh, um, Simmel and Lukács is, he was a, a and in, in English, I it's I don't know, um, it's not a happy translation, but it would be like he was a great inspirer. Um, it is like uh, like somebody, a great person who could empower you. Actually, that's literally what he means, and that's true. I will come back in a second for um, all the students, um, at least the most gifted ones. Um, and so, Simmel, I have. Um, standing on one foot, so to speak, to talk about Simo. Um, his important thing is um, that he looks as a social theorist about everything that, including uh, the sociology of knowledge, as a phenomenon of the approach of the social relations as specific social forms in which we act between us. And that's uh, one thing that goes is a theme in Sussman, but she takes it and runs with it. The other thing she takes in bronze with it is that basically everything he writes is essays. He is um, a, a modern philosopher who makes the essay not only a respectable, respectable tool, but actually um, makes it um, like, uh, like co-equal with treatises and so forth. And that fact of breaking the essay free from the philosophical tradition and making it its own independent um, instrument is what is crucial for Sussman. So after Simmel, um, for a, a critical philosopher, we do not anymore have to write a master work. Um, but um, the essays, whatever lengths they are, are good enough uh, because they have their own metaphysical relay system. And I would argue that is one of the reasons why um, Sussman actually felt in, literally empowered. I'm sure they never talked about that, but um, uh, you can see how that works. So Simmel's new way to do philosophy uh, opened the way for doing so no longer and as a sign of a strictly male-dominated form of reasoning, and I come back to that, to that in a minute, but follow, allowed it to break free from the old straight jacket of academic thinking, uh, thinking not just outside the box, but also outside of the institutional protocols that is expect, especially required, um, you know, right master works. So you could say um, that uh, Margaret Sussman, by not being allowed in Germany, was simply not possible at the time to write a PhD. Rosa Luxemburg, for instance, wrote a PhD, uh, but she did so in. Um, uh, actually, it was uh, in war technically at that point, but she did it in, in, in an economy. So it's, but it was a doctorate in Switzerland um, where um, women were allowed to study and um, uh, complete your study. Um, but actually, um, Sussman also knows at some point, Luxembourg may have been one of the reasons why she was not allowed to study in Zurich because um, all this Russian Jewish highly intellectual women who came to Europe to study um, and roamed the streets of Zurich, they um, were a bad example for a uh, Mr. Sussman from, uh, from Hamburg who wanted his daughter to be a respectable person. 
And so it is funny, um, and I say that also um, not without any problem because Sussman loved Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and so basically that was the situation. So she um, actually, so what I wanted to say, um, she actually had the privilege or the, the advan intellectual advantage to not have to write a dissertation and that set her free. I mean, writing a dissertation doesn't uh, incapacitate you, but it possibly could. So by abandoning the notion of the masterwork, for instance, and replacing it by the form of the essay, writing philosophy remained no longer in the domain of a discourse practice reserved to the entitled class of the pro professorate that is the privileged male elite. And that's saying it really nicely. Um, we could even say that Simmel was already a precursor of a theory of man's playing in his 1911 essay, The Relative and the Absolute in the Problem of the Sexes. And I wrote here, I should expand a bit, but I think you don't have time, but I can, can come back in, in a, uh, later in the discussion. But I can just, again, summarize it maybe in the way that Simmel's argument, uh, it's a highly interesting argument, uh, is that why men really cannot understand women? Because the distinction male-female is a male distinction. And as we know um, from, uh, especially if you want to go back to Luma, but as we know actually now from Simmel, because he already has that idea, um, distinctions are always asymmetrical. And so therefore they mute the one they exclude. And so he, in this wonderful essay of his, he explains why anything a woman would say can never really be understood by a man because um, it just doesn't uh, like cross up uh, across the distinction. And so um, that is, um, I think, something that also Sussman uh, allowed her to, um, um, or uh, like that, that discourse. I mean, at that point, she was done with her studying with Simmel, but. Um, that understanding sort of reflects the, um, his understanding of the problematic. So we should not underestimate how this assessment by Simmel would empower uh, Sussman, yeah, I said that. Um, and also, of course, when I say that, I do not mean again that um, like she is following him, but it, that friendship and that understanding um, is a, a, a very powerful tool and I'll come back about that because Sussman was giving back what she learned from him to others. Um, so a little bit more about Simmel. So while Simmel's support went a long way, uh, this historiography of philosophy only counts three figures as distinct philosophical figures that he inspired. I mean, there's a bunch of them, but those are the big names, okay? Which is Martin Buber, Ernst Bloch, and George Lukács. Um, and it's interesting because the missing force of the gamma force uh, was, of course, Sussman. Um, but it's only becoming clear when you actually look at how this history is written. So it, it is maybe also no coincidence that the only continuous friendship between those three um, that was to last for a lifetime uh, for Sussman was the one with Martin Buber. Um, and not just for... Um, uh, emotional and psychological reasons, but um, because among the four, those four people, Sussman and Buber shared the closest relation to Simmel's intellectual legacy and unfolded it in, in interesting ways. And um, when you read um, um, Buber's introduction to this, the, this book series, he edited the Gesellschaft, the Society, for which he actually wanted Simmel to be the general editor. And Simmel said, no, no, you know, you're, um, at that point, Buber was like 29 or so. Uh, no, younger, a little bit younger. He said, no, that's yours. You do it. If you any help you need, I, I help you. You do it. And so in uh, one of the, uh, inter in the introduction of the first monograph, um, Buber actually introduces the famous term, the interhuman. And the interhuman is um, also um, always held as sort of the, an early version of what is the dialogical. It's also, if you read it carefully, just a very brilliant summary of the entire kernel of Simmel's sociology. Um, so that's how close they were. Um, 
And um, so, uh, so in that way, there's a, a natural thing that until Buber dies a year before Zussmann, they constantly are in touch. Um, in short, Zussmann should not be understood as a new student of Simmel, but rather Simmel as the, as, as the one who offered a philosophically liberating approach that allowed her to see herself as a philosopher in her own right, equal to any man and helped, and what helped her to um, set herself free on her own terms. That's the important thing. So with him, she never felt she has to assimilate or submit or anything, which uh, poor Edith Stein, for instance, didn't have with somebody like Husserl um, and others with other uh, teachers. So, so for today's lecture, I just want to focus on a few of her writings now to characterize her thinking. But before we look at some of her central ideas, you should know that while Simon Sussman has largely been sunk into oblivion, she was at her time a prominent and distinct voice during the first part, at least, of the 20th century. And especially um, in, so in the late imperial phase, like she started in 1907 again, she like, and you know that um, if you imagine that like a couple of just important newspapers and you would be reviewed it and everybody reads it, everybody knows it, they are feared and respected art critics. And um, so it's, uh, you can't imagine that she would not be known. She was really known. People wanted, uh, Rosenzweig badly wanted to be reviewed by her, others wanted to be reviewed. Um, and that's an entire story for itself. Um, so uh, she's really a victim of the forgetfulness of post war and that's the important thing, not of her time, um, because um, they didn't help that much, but um, the actual forgetfulness happens then in the post-war that didn't completely erase her, but, and that's the more important thing, and that's how communications work in all these the insidious ways, but distorted the memory of her work often ironically by relegating her to the Holocaust discourse, but omitting the significance of all her writing prior to the Shoah. Because she did write, um, and we'll get to that, um, a, a very important stuff about the Shoah. Um, and so she's celebrated for that. She's put in the niche of the Jewish philosophers um, at the expense of sort of ignoring her entire other stuff that is uh, truly striking and actually cannot in any way be uh, separated from what she writes about the Holocaust. Okay. So just briefly, I should mention that from 1907, I did already well into the 1930s, Sussman was, a, so it's over more than 25 years, Sussman was a prominent uh, uh, voice to, um, during the Weimar Republic and initially the, the late years of the Kaiser Reich, as it was called, the Imperial Germany. She belongs to the, the uh, she belongs to the Weimar intellectuals to be counted with. From 1907 to 1932, she writes as a regular to uh, in front in the Frankfurt Zeitung where she covered all the new publications and she has one beautiful essay. I mean, no, it's not beautiful, I should say. It's, the best thing is the title, which is called Exodus out of philosophy, not, uh, and she uses Exodus, not the German equivalent to bring drive home the biblical connotation where she also first mentions the story of redemption by Rundsweig, which she then will review and write about in essay after essay or rewrite after rewrite later. Um, but she also writes for, uh, and that review, the, the first important one is in Buber's edited Der Jude. Um, then she writes in Der Morgen, where she's also editor, a Jewish monthly or bi-monthly, I think actually. But now comes the fun part. She also writes for Landauer's Der Socialist, the socialist. And now just imagine that. She um, also writes um, for the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, which is completely uh, funny. Uh, she, and I tell you in a moment why. 
She writes there in 1914, uh, a few weeks into uh, the war in August 1914, a front page article. I mean, imagine an intellectual being printed, like not even a Swiss in Switzerland being printed um, on the uh, front page uh, at the beginning of World War II. Um, and it's so interesting because the socialist is the socialist is social. The Neue Zürcher Zeitung is the representative of the capital and um, a liberal paper, but I must say liberal in Switzerland is what the conservative socialists. Um, so every time I travel back, I have to sort of rethink the scheme. So while Sussman left behind, and, and then of course there are a number of other papers. She writes, she's really a public voice. She, while Sussman left behind a work of numerous books and essays, I would like to use the remaining time to introduce you, you now to the first and the last philosophical work. Um, I should also say that she kept lecturing. She was really in that way a public intellectual. The first one is um, Of the Meaning of Law, which was published 1912, very early. I will give you a little bit of a snapshot. I give you then a little bit of a shorter snapshot of the book she's really famous for. But it's not translated into English, I hope yet. It will be translated at some point, but it's not an easy book. Um, the Book of Job and the Destiny of the Jewish People, which was published 1946 with a second preface, 1948. So of meaning uh, of meaning of love, um, uh, I should first say uh, that the, to, to clarify, um, it, it's not about love, it's about the meaning of love. And that's the distinctive thing that needs to be, you need to be reminded of. So um, already there are certain sophistication. So she's not interested to write about love, um, but about what is the meaning of love. And I come to that in a, in a second. Here again, Sussman is confronted in this book or her first book, um, you know, at that point, um, 1912, she is 40. So she starts the first book, 40, which is like good tradition since Kant, people start a little later. But um, with her, one has to imagine that she really writes uh, in her mature age, most of it later. Um, and she becomes, as she turns 90 in her life, it's, she, it's such a rich life that the contextualization needs to be constantly um, factored in. Um, so here again, Sussman is confronted with her first book uh, with the question how to speak philosophically as a woman about a subject philosophy basically deems as philosophically irrelevant or at best, uh, at best of, uh, sorry, irrelevant or at best maybe just merely more of marginal interest. So basically love, as you know, um, doesn't exist in philosophy. Um, there's a little um, nice uh, line by Simmel who says, yeah, you know, Plato did something, Schopenhauer did something, it wasn't really helpful. Um, we need actually a metaphysics of, and just as we need the epistemology and a metaphysics of ethics, we also do need a, a theory of what, uh, how to approach and think well. Um, as a result, Sussman's book, faces the challenge to address um, this, uh, to address the approach with it, 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 it approaches this topic as well. Um, and that makes it a little bit of a complicated book. Also, it is, the style is very difficult. Um, so you have to sort of like really um, think through and like sort of tease out. The, so I give you very few quotes. Um, because her style is seems on the outside always as idealistic, uh, while in fact it sort of countermands idealism as well as materialism. So it's just constantly negotiating that. And so there's the problem of, um, so one of the things uh, she uh, analyzes is that the problem of language um, that she has when she describes these relations that of love, um, that is how the language in which we represent our ideas in general, and especially the ones of love, 
is informed by the social arrangements that have become problematic and obsolete. So just even writing about it in, in a way that doesn't uh, get caught in, uh, in the protocols that I do it, um, sort of ran through the whole book. So we need to rethink the relations between men and women and you. Um, and, but we can't just do that like that because we are so, and it's a highly, because we are so informed by language that we have to rethink the discourse of language. And we can't just make up new um, symbols or, or new languages. So um, that is, so when we want to, we can't just sit back and say, so what does love mean and go on, that we have to sit back and sort of do a deeper kind of work. Um, so that is um, two of, uh, that's the, the, the question. And she has in the book actually an inter and sort of a decade before, because here are interesting ideas about um, the power of some symbolic representations and how we, how they operate. So uh, love for, uh, just to get to the gist of it, love is not for Sussman the answer, but the social forms, the, the social expressions of various social forms we give to our desires and fantasies, which in turn are fueled by our ideas and notions. So we need to imagine and rethink the way we think about love and feel about it as well. And so um, just to sort of take you through the main points here is a little bit uh, in a reductive way is that um, for her, I, I, it's, it's a direct quote, love is not created with the, cre of, with the creation of the individual together. So, um, but love creates the individual. So love is prior. So we have already a very nice post-subjective um, level here. I mean, she is like the person who translates Bergson's introduction to metaphysics. She uh, read her Nietzsche. She is uh, the same uh, unavoidably on the, at the level of her time. And so in that way, love is already uh, prior and not accessible. So love is, uh, but now she does interesting stuff with it. So love is a primal mover that forms life. And as a result, the process of immediation. So, so we are sort of a product of that power of love. We can't access it directly. Okay. This leads to the following paradox. The question then is, how is the alterity of the other to be reconciled with the desire for union with that other that we already think love is, since alterity is after all the condition for love? So the, our desire for union would always end in love because um, we would extinguish the other. And that's the question. And Sussman's answer is um, complete. Uh, let, let's just read it. Love is to, is to suffer being other and to more profoundly suffer being one. And so here's the thing. So if you think um, just being other is hard, um, being one is actually worse. Okay. And it's because then um, it's over. Um, and so like you have to, so the, 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 the entire cultural tradition of what is love, just the union with the other is yes for her because uh, uh, um, it just and do, does actually uh, what, uh, how it works. Um, and so then she has the end of the sentence is, so I read again the beginning, love is to suffer the other, Understand and to more profoundly suffer being one, Einstein, and its eternal demand is to reconcile the being other with the being one. Um, and that can never be done, really. So here you have some early form of biological thinking. The problem Sussman suggests is that all the culture with its refined literature and art of the past has only re reinforced the cultural fixation on union or separation without helping us imagine the meaning of love in alternative forms. So what is often imagined as the ultimate consummation of love turns out to be rather the problem of dissolution and annihilation. In other words, 
since mom, I quote her again, love can never grasp the essence of the other because their essence cannot be experienced under the category of form. And now comes the Simelian uh, term, which but this time is this one, where there is essence, there is form no longer. Okay. So um, love is precisely not all we need, uh, which is interesting what the Greek is open a year after this, this mom has died, but um, is actually precisely sort of the misleading thing. But love is still important, but it's the meaning of love and I come to that and then we're done with that. As a result, the you remains ultimately ungraspable, out of reach and incomprehensible. Love can only be communicated by way of symbolization, which seeks to reflect the other only through their manifestation, never as the essence, only through its form. As a result, love is not the final answer to our desires. Um, and that's the frustration uh, one gets if one never figures it out. But uh, so love is not the final answer to our desires, but simply a more interesting and a more important way, the form of expressing relationships, which either confuse or clear up our relationship to, with and to the world, depending on how we are able to give form love, uh, we give form to love. And so love, when we get its meaning, we see how it actually operates. And that's the answer. And so um, the last quotation from the book, the goal um, of the human being, even in the most profound love, cannot, can neither be given nor taken by a human being, uh, from a human being by another. So you will never in love find the answer. You always will find its form. Um, but she continues, but this goal can be re revealed through this love. So it's through the form of the love that you can sort of interpret and figure out the meaning of life, not through love itself. That's why it's of the meaning of love. Well, this was an unduly abbreviated summary of some of Susman's thoughts, wrote in her early book, they communicate or resonate, or you can say anticipate, but um, I don't want to use that hard words, but you can say that in, in remarkable ways with those, for instance, of Uber Levinas, and there's moment in Derrida when she talks about maternity, about the manners of maternity and the foreignness of the child uh, for the mother. Um, that is just fantastic. So, um, but the, uh, this 1912 essay, you know, imagine this like what 90 years old, uh, no, 110 years old. They also point the way to Sussman's post World War I thinking about the role of women in a world that has fallen apart. And I'm not going to um, dwell on that too much, but I give you, uh, I think, one of the most stirring uh, sentences. Uh, she writes in an essay in January 1933. Um, uh, I mean, it's published then, so she wrote it a little bit before Hitler took over, but it um, resonates in an uncanny way. Uh, when she darkly notes, I quote, when finally almost overnight the doors opened to the desired world, this took place in a most tremendous collapse. It turned out Man had no word at all to offer to woman. All his orders and laws had disintegrated. And you can imagine where it goes from there. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and it's also, you could argue very timely, yet in other ways. And also consider how politically precise it's co consolated. It's not a general, like, you know, there's no word. It's like really a politically, Coded. Um, and so I want to conclude, and I'm going to be shorter and irresponsibly shorter on um, the question of how to live after Auschwitz, um, which uh, you know all the famous books. There's Fackenheim, there's um, Adorno, there's a whole bunch of people. 
nobody knows of Zeusman. There is a little answer why actually. And if you really want to know, you can ask me the Q&A. I was not planning to talk about it, but um, there is probably an answer. Um, the answer is why we don't have yet a translation. Sussman's The Book of Job and the Destiny of the Jewish People was published in 1946, I mentioned. And uh, it was republished in 1948 with a preface because the foundation of the state of Israel in May 48, um, she felt uh, required like a, another um, thinking through, and she was actually very uh, of thinking through the Shoah. She was really, and she was a staunch um, non Zionist, I should say. At some point, she writes, I think, to Shulam, um, of course, tellingly. Um, that of course, if she were young, or she would go to Israel, you know, you know to show them. But um, that's a spe special context, so there was no such thing. She had a long life, and she never um, considered it at any point. Um, so I would say um, it is one really, if not the first book as a response to the Holocaust. Um, probably at the same time with Schwarzbach, but I'm not sure whether it's a little later, but again, priorities don't matter here in terms of temporality, but uh, it is really a very early one. And that's important also because of that, it's of course also not as sophisticated as people write like decades and decades later, but it does ask some um, harrowing questions. It poses the question really, Straightly direct, that's our book about how is Jewish life possible in the wake of the Shoah? Is it at all? Um, and she uses the Job, the figure, which she used earlier um, when she wrote the, which we acknowledge today as the first essay on Kafka in the 1920s. Um, she already develops the figure of Job as the example in Kafka, but here we have a different. Job and so um, change times, as you know, has a little changed. Um, um, and so Job is uh, not just um, the figure of suffering, but also of dealing with, with this suffering counter to his friends with questions ventriloquize theological reasoning. And uh, so that's my argument when people say it's a theological book. I have a whole chapter in one of my books uh, why it's not theological. It's very easy because Job himself is not theological. It's his friends who give him all the reasons why things do wrong, who sort of give you all the theological reasons, of course. Um, so there's no justification in the book of Job of suffering, no explanation, no rationalization by Job. That service is all done by his friends, so to speak. Um, but what um, happens in the book of Job, according to Sussman, and one could argue also actually happened in the book of Job, but Sussman sort of philosophically um, sort of fleshes it out a little bit, is a turning, you could say a chuba, but not in the religious sense, a turning of a perspective away from any form of teleological reasoning, for instance, that like there would be a purpose or a providence in what happened, but it's a reason that is everywhere a preordained order or rule. And that it's it's a it's a powerful move away and it's basically um, saying you can say God did that because of any sentence structure like that is impossible with since Job and also uh, for Sussman whether Job with her, if you take the philosophy seriously, any philosophy basically would do that is uh, unusable, like this, uh, well, uh, well, you can fill in the adjectives you would like to, to uh, use here. In, in contrast, Sussman's recourse to the book of Job opens the eyes to the unfathomable and the limits of our reason with which we have to live. That's the real move. Rather, the task is to learn with, with these, uh, to learn to live with these limits and reckon with them, um, and not expect at the end of the day 
some surprise uh, uh, reason jumping out from somewhere. I can't even try to do justice to this book that is so complex, rich, and challenging. What I want to convey at this point today is simply the significance of the contribution to seeking an answer to the unanswerable and Sussman's insistence to neither submit to the pressure to give any answer, to submit to any theological theme, nor any last philosophical answer either, but to show how Joe, beyond religion and philosophy, and that's the move she does, finds his quote unquote answer in realizing that his questions remain unanswerable, but that this impossibility for ultimate answers doesn't pose, but instead opens the possibility for ethical life in new ways. Remarkably, Sussman herself had doubts and second thoughts, hesitating again and again to release the book for print. And their letters um, to my mentor, Thor Schmidt, um, who sort of brought it her along, like supported her. She had real doubt. She was struggling with it. She uh, almost couldn't take it. And um, she was not extremely old, but she was in her 70s. It was a profound struggle with, with this most difficult subject. She was literally, um, she didn't know she, um, she wanted to hold on. She said, yet another day, I need to write the last sentence. I have to, the last sentence keeps going wrong. I have to redo it. And at some point she said, I can't stand it anymore. It's just too much. I just said, I want to kiss it goodbye, the baby or I send it off. Um, and chess to be, I actually have it all for chess. So it is, I mentioned that because it really, it poses problems about suffering in a book that are sometimes difficult uh, to take in a way, um, depending how you read it. I think there's some ways to look at it, but um, the way she talks about suffering as something one has to take up is, is heartfelt. And I think the greatness is that she doesn't give an answer that you shouldn't or you should. Um, so Sussman's last book seeks to grapple with, with this horrendous and uh, with the horrendous and unspeakable elements of Shoah. And you could also say any book who does it well is probably not a good book. In that way, if it gives you final, if, if it's not a work in progress, it's really um, that's what it was. However, the book refuses to offer final answers. Instead, it, and I think that's its uh, merit, it liberates us to ask the questions and continue to ask the questions we bring to the challenge to respond to this tremendous catastrophe. And now I just want to uh, come to the conclusion uh, about her legacy to uh, sort of uh, a few points. Um, one is, um, his, and that's beside her writings. There's um, other legacies, and that's her role as a genuine interlocutor, a dialogist. Um, and we know now, and it's not, we are not, it just started to uh, come out uh, in research the, that she had an active um, involvement in the Huber Rosenzweig Bible translation as an uh, interlocutor to both Huber and Rosenzweig. Um, she was crucial for Bloch, um, and uh, it's um, a lot of what Bloch writes about hope um, and other themes. And, um, she writes earlier at the same time, but differently. Always, I think, more more interestingly, for my taste, um, she was actually a mentor of Jan Krakauer until uh, that ended. Uh, she was a sought-out reader. Like uh, some people uh, wanted to be read by here by her, they wanted validation. So she had a, a, a like a judgment there, and that was Bloch, of course, who dedicated a book to her. I forgot to say, Simmel dedicated a book to her, of course, and said that the dedication was the best part of the book. Um, Rosenzweig wanted to be reviewed by her. Uh, Scholem. Uh, wanted to be read by her, brings her the books, uh, looks down on her, but wants to be read by her. It's too short and it's complicated. Um, and then there were numerous impulses on contemporary thinkers 
Um, and they're not easy to track down because precisely what I mentioned in the beginning, um, it was sort of a cavalier thing uh, not to reverence women uh, colleagues, but only men. And um, that but, uh, became the, the research and the, it's, it's starting. And uh, it's interesting because we can read them better and we can also understand the real significance of Sussman. And I want to just mention two um, to my delight. Uh, we have now uh, somebody as a postdoc, not a postdoc, actually a research fellowship um, of the Gottfried Foundation, who looks into the papers and just shows what I sort of knew, um, but not how deep and how much. Goldschmidt himself really learned, and he was one of the uh, really um, student, what you could say, or, or mentors of uh, Sussman, um, who acted. Um, and the other one, to your surprise, was Paul Celan. Paul Celan read the Book of Job. Um, he read um, at some point a lot of her writings, and we can, there's even um, like they're tracked, like they're, they're even published, like what he underlined. The theologically most ironic thing is that the most important book, the Book of Job, is absent from his library. So, therefore, we, uh, we can't reconstruct it, but we have documents. And, um, but more important was also um, at the end of her life, uh, he sought her out. He, he traveled a few times to, from Paris to Zurich just to be with her, to talk to her. Um, and those things, um, they are quite important. Um, if you read the Meridian, his speech, if you look at his poetry, it can be tracked. I'm not interested in identification games in literature, um, but um, Celan can be much better understood if we know that. Um, and so um, I want to end on, on that note of her legacy, not just the writings, which is clear, but something that is also has to do with the Ichthyosus mom, like what she brings to it and what she also got from Simmel in a way, but also did in a different way, um, that besides her writing, then her generous willingness to dialogue and mentor and her mentorship must be considered her last and certainly not least contribution to philosophy. And um, especially if you think about in line of a tradition of rethinking the relationship between theory and praxis that runs from Spinoza to Marx through Adorno and Derrida, Humont and beyond, that here too, Sussman has one more time demonstrated and without big proclamations and pretensions. And what is foremost also interesting, not as an institutionalized chair of philosophy, but outside of academia, she has actually, in an enviously way, um, fantastic way, um, achieved what we can only dream of um, to actually um, produce profound and significant general philosophical work, just also by being there and being a resource for her, not students, but for her mentors. I thank you very much.